researchers are exploring the potential of utilizing the AI powered tool ChatGB. Is it Chat, Chat GBT? GPT. GPT for patient diagnosis and its potential to alleviate waiting times in emergency departments. Mm, would you trust it? In a recent study, uh, this language model, which is what it has demonstrated, promising capabilities apparently in generating lists of patient diagnoses and identifying the most probable health concerns. Would you trust it? Well, today we're asking, can robots save the NHS? Broadcaster, lawyer and futurist Andrew Eborn is with us. And former NHS Trust CEO Dr Peter Carter joins us as well. Welcome to you both. Good morning. And can I just say, what yeah. a brilliant introduction, and I'll let you into a secret. The producers and I, behind the scenes, got chat GPT to write it. So what you've just you written, didn't. it was written by AI. Well, frankly, I thought it was a bit wordy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, there you go. It can do so that, well, I wouldn't have known. I wouldn't have known. It's, so that impresses me. Peter, what do you make of it all? I mean, is something like chat GPT something which we can entrust our health to? Yes, absolutely. Um, AI is something we've got to embrace. We don't see it as a threat. Um, it will not save the NHS, but boy, properly used, it's going to make a huge impact. And we've got to be careful of the Luddites. Um, I remember years ago when the Da Vinci robotic machine was introduced, and there were a few old crusty Luddites that were saying, oh, this will never replace a surgeon. But it's not going to replace, they didn't replace a surgeon. What it did, it enhanced their ability to do even better surgery. And I see the possibilities of AI are limitless, are, are, are limitless. And what we should do is, as I say, embrace it. It needs to be properly regulated and then safeguards need to be put in. But I'm really excited. And it can make a huge impact on waiting lists. And the study that will be presented um, uh, in the coming weeks in Barcelona, I think is very interesting. But it, the, the team there, um, this is on the diagnosis of people in A&E, they acknowledge there's more work to be done, but I, I certainly think the possibilities are huge. But Andrew, how would that work if it's a language um, software or whatever? Yes. If it's a language thing, how is it going to help diagnose? Will I, it talk to us and ask us questions well, about... Well, a number of things. So, so what happened, there's a, a recent survey in the Netherlands where they did basically 30 different paces, uh, cases that went to A&E and they put in the data and they also put in the total lab results and they compared it to what normal doctors would, would diagnose and what chat GPT would do. And what happened is they found out that actually 87% they got the right diagnosis, the doctors, but 97% was chat GPT. So it's managed to be even better than normal doctors. And there was a glorious case. I, every time I come and join you, we talk about uh, the massive advances in AI and how it's going to revolutionise every aspect of our life. And there was some case uh, about a four-year-old boy who'd seen 17 different doctors, none of whom could pick up what was wrong with them. And apparently what happened, they tapped in all these relevant symptoms into chat GPT, and it is a bit of a mouthful, as you say, Anne. They've chapped, tapped it in, and they managed to say, look, it was tethered cord syndrome, which this boy had, and it was successfully diagnosed. But as your other guest pointed out, these are tremendous tools which be used to actually enhance what the profession can do, rather than to replace them. And but it's rather like you work on that sort of basis. Yeah, except, Peter, I mean, if, if they're, I mean, it's because it's got, it's got access to a whole wealth of data it can access practically immediately. And so if it's getting a 97% correct diagnosis, at what point in the future do, do, do doctors say, well, actually, we, we don't need to go through this. We don't need to waste our time checking these results. No, it's a complementary relationship. Um, <clears throat> you will need both. I can never see a time when um, everything will be handled remotely or by robotics or by AI. But what you do, you embrace it and you use it to take it forward. I mean, one of the areas where it's already proving its worth is in the uh, scanning of um, CT scans uh, in radiology, <clears throat> where it's proving incredibly <clears throat> effective about picking up issues that perhaps the human eye might struggle to do with. So it will enhance, uh, it will speed things up. But as, as your other guest has said, the, the, this very interesting study in the Netherlands, 
um, it needs further work to be developed. Um, so as I would see it, it's a symbiotic relationship and I'm all for it. Finally, Andrew, can I just ask you that there's a lot of talk at the moment about bringing in a Martha's Law, which gives you the, the legal right to demand a second opinion yeah. if you're worried in A&E or something. If you're worried you're not being taken seriously enough or your symptoms aren't, you know, you're being sort of dismissed slightly. And you wonder whether if you demand a second opinion, you could demand it of this AI. I, I think, and, and you're absolutely right. I think it would provide that second opinion. And what's great, the University of California, San Diego, what they basically said is that they compared whether chat GPT is more empathetic than chatting to your GP. And what it found out <laughs> is... That's <laughs> awful. Uh, it is. But they found out that actually it was significantly better because it would give more detailed answers. It would have more time to explain about what the conditions were and the possibilities. So I think the future is tremendously exciting and I'll continue to be an advocate uh, to support it.